Hello, everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, November 1st. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's show. Today's topic is technology integration in junior high. Uh, your show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffat, that's me, and Tammy Moore, who isn't with us today. So we may not have closed captioning today. Our special guests are Cactus Canyon Junior High teachers from Apache Junction, Arizona. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will introduce Bethany. All right. Good morning to all of you, or evening if it's not morning for you. Uh, we are so excited to have this group of teachers here to share with us today. Someone commented in the in the chat that they're they haven't heard the term junior high for a while, and most of them have been using the term middle school. But they're all the same age group uh, in that sort of uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade sometimes. But I am thrilled to be bringing a special group of Arizona educators to share with you today. Um, I had the opportunity to hear them do this presentation at a, an educators forum here in Arizona and just loved it. And I knew that it would be something all of you would enjoy too. So I asked them if they would be willing to come and do this in an online webinar so that more people can hear the exciting things they're doing. And they all agreed. So here they are today. I'd like to introduce Bethany Lillian. Um, first, and then she's going to take over and introduce her team, answer the newbie question, and take it away. So Bethany has been teaching middle school science for 18 years in Apache Junction. She's currently the school site collaboration coaching lead. So together with the other collaboration coaches, and maybe she'll be telling us about what collaboration coaches do. Her, her other collaboration coaches include Cheryl, Jason, and Reagan, who are all sharing with us today. And they work together with other teachers on the staff, helping them to learn to integrate technology into their classroom instruction. She is also participating in a science teacher leadership program in Arizona that's focused on learning about the new uh, next generation science standards. So it's going to be great to see some examples of what they're doing with that. So I want to give a huge warm Classroom 20 Live welcome to our teachers from Arizona. And I'm going to advance to the newbie question and ask Bethany to get us started with this. And then she can take over and introduce her team and their presentation. So tell us, what exactly does technology integration mean to you? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Peggy, for inviting us to uh, participate in this uh, experience. Um, this is the first time that I have actually shared in a uh, webinar experience. I have um, done, done my fair share of participating, but uh, actually to be the presenter is new. And uh, the other three, while we are a technology school, this is the first time that they have uh, actually participated in a webinar as well. So uh, we ask for your forgiveness <laughs> if things are a little bit rocky, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to gain something useful. Um, when we started Cactus Canyon at junior high uh, five years ago, we were going to be a one-to-one -one school, meaning that for each student we were going to have a device. And our devices are either Chromebooks or netbooks. And uh, we were told that we were no longer going to be uh, able to use any kind of textbooks. And we had to learn what it meant to be um, integrating technology into our instruction. And over the last five years, we have uh, slowly developed uh, um, tools and strategies in our instruction that just means that students are using technology in meaningful ways to communicate with us as the teacher, to communicate with their peers in the classroom, and also to communicate with others outside of the classroom. And it's, technology is not something that um, is an event in the classroom, but it's simply uh, using tools that are 21st century tools 
tools that students use outside of school for um, their learning opportunities. So that's what technology integration means to us here at Cactus Canyon. And I'm curious to uh, find out what other people think that technology integration means um, in their, in their uh, classroom or in, in whatever learning environment that they might be involved in. So um, if you want to go ahead and uh, share out some ideas in the chat box about what you think technology integration means, that would be great. I'll give you a, a couple seconds to do that. And so that we don't have a whole lot of dead air, um, while you're sharing your ideas, I'll just go ahead and tell you a little bit about ourselves um, in, at Cactus Canyon. Again, we started uh, Cactus Canyon five years ago with all of our seventh graders uh, having a, a device in their hands. And uh, we do focus a lot on project-based learning in our instruction as well. And I see uh, Susie saying that it's just using technology to accomplish what you'd like without really having to stop and think about what you want to use. Yeah. Yeah, the trick is uh, using tech that's appropriate to learning. Sometimes uh, it's, it can be a chore to try to figure out what tool or what device or what application is going to um, be the most useful and user friendly in the classroom. Uh, we've had a big learning curve of uh, using apps or devices and thinking, oh, this will be really quick and easy to throw into a lesson. And then it turns out that you're having to teach a whole brand new skill. And that takes the entire class period for students to figure out, oh, how to use this application. And then you have to move the lesson on for a second day so now they can implement using the tool to actually learn the content that you're wanting them to learn. So that's been tricky. But, um, but we've, we've learned some uh, ways to um, get over those hurdles. So I'll go ahead and move on and go ahead and continue to share your ideas. We'll address them as we go on. Um, what we want teachers to do with technology, we want them to increase engagement, improve their learning attitudes, and individualize instruction. That's been a key thing, um, especially with the common core standards that Arizona has adopted. We refer to them as the career and college, college readiness standards in Arizona, but knowing how students learn best and then being able to implement learning opportunities for students to get the content. And we do want students to be inspired um, and be creative with what they're learning and how to show us and demonstrate what it is that they've learned. And another goal is that we are preparing students to enter the world after high school and getting them ready to enter the workforce and having those technology skills ready to go. And one of those skills is being able to collaborate with their peers. And so trying to use different strategies in the classroom so that they know how to work with, again, one another shoulder to shoulder and also interact with people that aren't in the same room with them. And then also just teaching them positive di digital actions. What does it mean to be a good digital citizen, specifically making sure that we're giving credit where credit's due and not just ripping things off of Google um, inappropriately or uh, and how to cite sources and that type of thing. Uh, another thing that we uh, want to kind of focus on uh, with the students particularly is just, again, raise awareness and start conversations and find answers to their questions. Um, uh, one of the things that is emphasized in the framework for K-12 science, which the next generation science standards are based on, is getting students to ask questions. And it's not just the questions that teachers are asking that's important, but it's the questions that students are asking that are the most important. And then helping them find the answers to those questions. Working with partners, again, in the classroom and outside of the classroom, giving them the power to change minds and make a difference and take action and to drive change. I think that's a really important idea uh, for students to uh, 
when we're, as teachers, we're trying to get them to use the technology. So that's our framework here at Cactus Canyon in Apache Junction, Arizona. And uh, we have uh, three teachers beside myself who have found unique ways to use technology in their classroom. And I'm going to go ahead and start off with Cheryl Anderson. And as she makes her way to the microphone, uh, we're going to have her uh, share a, a really neat way of how she is teaching economics in her classroom. And uh, so I'm just going to introduce you to her. She's one of our 8th grade and 7th grade social studies teachers. And she is uh, very well experienced and she has her, uh, prior to being a teacher, she was uh, working in the business world. So she loves to incorporate some of those ideas as well as she's teaching social studies. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Cheryl. Thank you very much. Um, I've got to tell you that I'm the probably the oldest person on campus. I like them to refer to me as ancient and wise one. But when I was in junior high, technology was a little different. And you're seeing some of the things that were available to students when I was in junior high. By the time I got to high school, they had improved remarkably. Thank you so much. Uh, as you can see, instead of black phones, we had colored phones, so that technology was significant. We actually had electric typewriters instead of the, the manual typewriters, and there was actually some nod toward uh, calculators instead of slide rules. But things today are a lot different. We've got kids that have been on computers since they were little babies, and my job as an eighth grade teacher is just to try to teach them something without putting them to sleep. So I thought, well, let's have them buy and sell real things, not just uh, candy bars. And uh, if we're really good at being capitalists, maybe we could uh, do something amazing at the end of the school year. If we're not very good, we'll probably have a pizza party because that's what they'll be able to afford. We started an eBay site. I have an eBay site just for the 8th grade class, and we have our own PayPal account. Uh, we have students that have different jobs in the system. Uh, they go out to Goodwill or thrift stores or their closets, and they bring in things. They have a, a list of things that are usually profitable. So they each have a job to do and pass it on to the next person in the system. Uh, quality control, they have to go through and make sure all the parts are there, of course. Make sure things are clean. And as with any middle school or junior high school class, there is some urge to try out new things, maybe not just in inventory control. So they have a lot of fun doing that. Our accounting staff has to actually develop a spreadsheet. We do not have a computer class per se at Cactus Canyon, so that's incorporated into our individual classes, into our core classes. And in this particular class, they are using a spreadsheet and putting formulas in the spreadsheet so that they can keep track of all the inventory, the costs, and the profits. So at the end of the year, they'll know how much profit each class. I have three eighth grade classes, and they're in competition with one another to make the most profit. <coughs> well, we have a digital scale. They have to weigh, measure, package, get it ready to go out. They have to photograph the item for the eBay site. And they're getting pretty good at this. Then they have to do research. In order to price the item to sell, they have to look at the other items that are like it that have sold, and they have to make a decision about whether they're going to price their item at the same, lower, or higher, and explain why they chose to do that. Whenever we sell an item, it goes out with a handwritten thank you note. That's one a nod to the doing things the old way. And then we have a marketing manager who contacts 
the uh, school newspaper and tells them about all our successes. I thought it was kind of cute. The, the person that uh, is doing this in one class said, well, what about if we have a failure? I said, we don't tell that to the newspaper. This is, this is real life. We, we keep our failures to ourselves. Where we do report our failures is to the parents and to the um, administrators. We send them a letter once a month also and tell them about our successes and failures. Um, I've told the kids uh, quite a few times that sometimes you learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. Okay, Cheryl, thank you so very much for sharing that experience in your uh, classroom. And uh, those of you who are online, if you have questions or comments about that, you can go ahead and add them to the chat box. Um, but since uh, Cheryl brought in the uh, reporting to our uh, school newspaper, I'd like to go ahead and introduce to you Jason Davis, who is our journalism and yearbook uh, guru on campus. And so, and he has a lot of exciting things to share with you about um, all the accomplishments that our school blog has earned. Hi, good morning. My name is Jason Davis. I teach journalism and yearbook and also student council at Cactus Canyon. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the things that I do in, in mainly my journalism two class, which is my advanced class, and um, what we do to write our school newspaper, newspaper in quotation marks there because it's online entirely. But um, leading up to that, I do want to talk a little bit about my journalism one class, which is my introduction. I have way more kids in my journalism one class because you know, not all of them choose to go on to my to my advanced class, but this uh, sort of lays the groundwork um, of journalistic basics on how to write stories and other expectations that I have um, going forward in in the advanced class. So um, one of the things I do, it's my first main project after I teach the basics of writing journalistic style stories, is we do a radio broadcast and. The link to all of these things are in the live binder. In this radio broadcast, we use a voice thread. This is actually Reagan's daughter's uh, project. And with the radio broadcast, they, they go through the entire they go through the entire writing process. They do pre-writing, they do a rough draft, they do editing, they type a final draft, and then finally they do uh, a voice thread radio broadcast where they record their final final version in their own voice in a professional manner, they introduce it, they, they use a conclusion, a sign-off, and um, they do use picture with, pictures with it, so it's not entirely, it's not entirely all radio, um, but this is where I begin to teach them about Creative Commons, and all of their images have to be from Creative Commons and cited correctly, and, um, and that leads us into the, the major project of the, of the quarter, of the semester, I mean, and it's a two-page two newspaper. Um, I've turned it into what is a, sort of a, a portfolio of their work, and they put the, this semester they'll be putting in all of the stories they've written, um, they've written in my class onto their newspaper, and so they're going to have a, their four or five major writing assignments all in one place. I use a program called Lucid Press, which is now in the Google Suite, and. What we do there is we teach them the basics of layout and design, and I get a lot of stuff that's like, you know, why do you still have them to do, why do you still teach newspapers? Newspapers are going to die like 20 minutes ago, and most of my kids don't read a newspaper once a month, let alone once a week or every day. But the basics of, the basics of Lucid Press and newspaper design are exactly the same as the basics of laying out a website or designing a presentation or things like that. So all of those things go, they all go together and um, they end up with a really nice two-page, uh, it's Lucid Press, the name of the app is, it's called Lucid Press, oh yeah, it's in there. And um, you can, it's lucidpress.com, it is also free, as someone just mentioned on there. Uh, my original degree is actually in journalism. And when I was in, I, I learned to do this same type of work when I was in college on a program called Quark. And Quark costs something and it's hundreds of dollars. I think it might be six or eight hundred dollars per license. So if I was going to, if I was going to have to pay 
for this type of program, obviously our school would not be able to do this. And uh, so discovering that Lucid Press is free and does pretty much exactly the same thing as more advanced programs was a lifesaver for me personally. Um, one of the things I do in order to help kids, um, whether they miss a day or whether they are just advanced, is I've created a series of instructional videos. I have my own channel on, um, um, it's called Screencast-O-Matic, I believe is, is what it is. And I have a whole channel that guides students through each step of, uh, of the process. And I try to keep them short. Some are a little longer, but I try to keep them in the neighborhood of three, four minutes because, um, you know, it, I, I want to keep it simple for us to not do too many steps in one, in, in one video so students can figure out exactly where they are. I don't want to be telling them things they already know how to do and, and I want to keep their attention. And so if a student misses a day, I can say, um, this is the, this is the step that I gave instruction on yesterday. You can go and watch the video, and if you have any questions, you can come back and and I'll and I'll help you figure out what you missed. So it it really saves me time. Um, it, it's also some of the steps. Well, most of the steps are the same throughout the creation of the of the project. So if a student has forgotten how to add do a headline correctly or write a caption correctly or do the Creative Commons citation correctly. Um, they can go back and just and just watch it, watch a video. I don't need to re-give direct instruction on all of these things throughout. I can say, um, mo you know, if you remember how to do it, you can just go ahead and do it. And if not, you can go watch the video. You can step outside the classroom for four or five minutes and and they watch it. And it's and they come back in. And if they need help, I can help them. Otherwise, we move on. But um, I'm actually just starting this 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 project right now with my class, and I really like teaching it. And the kids really like the kids really like the final product. Um, the ones that do really really well and do a complete project, um, I end up I print them out in color for them at my own expense, and uh, they really uh, it really gives them something to work for. I show them examples that I've had from the past, and the and the, the color version, and uh, and they really like that. It gives them something to work for. So um, that's the, the basics. That's how I teach the basics. And then we move on to um, my journalism two class A. It's a smaller class, especially the first semester, because I have um, a lot of eighth graders that from the previous school year that don't come back because they go on to high school. So I have some I only have about twenty kids right now and in the second semester then my, my numbers go up. But um, we introduce first of all, a lot of you it looks like you've checked out our Cougar News blog, which is our school newspaper. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in the in on the next slide. Um, my new project for this year um, is I, I had them do an ad campaign because I get a lot of kids that have a lot of talent and they're really good writers. And I ask them what if they're interested in doing in being doing journalistic work for their career or if they would like to um, if they would like to do anything in in mass communications for their College major, and then I'll say, nah, you know, it's just it's writing, and I, you know, I know I'm kind of good at it, but I don't really want to do that. So I took them to the Arizona State University School of Journalism, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, which is a really good journalism school last last spring, and they saw that there's TV cameras and there's radio booths and a lot of different things, and they were really sort of inspired by like, wow, look what I can do if I want to have, if I want to do something with journalism as a career. So I created this ad campaign. It's a multimedia project. They still do writing. They write press releases, but they also get to design their own logo. They um, create advertisements for a magazine, for radio, for a newspaper. They design a website. And all of these things go back to um, them. It's all about the target audience. It's all about developing their brand. And they're really enjoying the using all of their these different skills and developing their product and and just they've really enjoyed doing this this campaign. I wish I had some examples, but um, I, I wasn't that far along in the original in the original presentation. Um, we're also always whenever it's going on, we're also doing 
Um, the Edge Blogs Challenge, which a few of you had said you participated in, Edge Blogs Challenge is um, it, it's a challenge for students run by Edge Blogs, and um, it's really nifty. Every week, uh, twice a year, for somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 or 12 weeks, they posted different challenges on their blog, and then they all have one overarching topic: um, digital citizenship. They, students get a chance to write around about their own family, about traveling, about just world issues and things like that. They get to tell personal stories, and um, they sometimes they have the opportunity to write. Sometimes they have opportunities to create presentations or try out new technology tools or practice ones they've already used. So we do that just about every week when there's a when when the challenge is going on, which it is right now, and then we'll go on again in the in the spring. So we're doing that, and um, I really like it because it gives students something different to write about. It's not always just doing interviews with teachers and students and putting it on the on Cougar News blog. Uh, they get to do its personal things and um, trying new things. So um, it's a nice break for them. And there's usually somewhere around seven, eight, nine challenges or activities among the among the topic for the week, and then they get to choose um, which one they want to do. Um, and then on to the Cougar News blog. The, this is my main this is my main deal. This is always the most important thing we're working on, even if we're doing the ad project, even if we're doing edge blogs, and sometimes we have three, four things going on at one time. But if students are writing stories for the blog, if they have interviews to do, if they have editing to do, anything like that, um, that's always our main priority. And what I really want to talk about with the blog is is the ownership factor. Um, when I have students who it is a it is a semester class, but if you could take it up to three times. And so my students that choose to take it more than once, the, I make them my editors. They automatically step into a leadership role upon their um, when they start their second semester. And it, uh, it's not even so much about these kids are the best writers or anything, but um, I think just giving them that leadership opportunity to um, to teach the new students that are coming in how to do um, how to do the, the, just the writing process, writing interview questions, um, following up on those things. Um, it gives them it, it gives them a sense of, of ownership of their blog, of their class, and um, and they they really they really embrace the role as leadership as leaders. And it, and then it gives me um, over on this side, that collaboration as they help these new students throughout the, the writing process. Um, I don't, after some initial instruction at the beginning of class, um, we do maybe a week or two of where I'm more involved with, with helping them learn how to do it. But after that, the editors really take over the day-to-day the -day instruction and in guiding the students through their stories. And um, it gives me an opportunity to work with every single student who writes a story and have a writing conference. And sometimes it takes five minutes and sometimes it takes 20 minutes. But um, whatever it is, then I can then I can focus on then I can focus on helping that student get better. By the time they get to me, they've gone through the entire process. They have edited the story with at least one editor and one other student. And then by the time they get to me, I can really help them focus on how to improve their writing and not necessarily where to fix a capital letter or where to put a comma. So it gives me more it gives me more one on one time with my students when they've ultimately finished their finished their story and we can and then they get to see it posted and they're just very happy. Um, some of the some of the other other ways that um, my kids show ownership or latch on to that latch on to the, the blog is that um, other than it, besides that it's student run and they're in charge is we get our stories run in the local newspaper, including the one that we wrote about Ms. Anderson's eBay project. I have on my next slide, I have um, a picture of my wall. They just they follow our blog. I used to have to send stories to them, and they would run them. And we've added to this since I took that picture. And now they just follow our blog, and they just pull stuff off when, when they like what we wrote, or they need space to fill, or or whatever. 
they um, whatever they want to do. So when we assign stories and when we're thinking of story ideas, um, a really big motivator for kids to accept story assignments is that sometimes maybe the ones that aren't the most fun to write are the ones that are most likely to end up in the newspaper. And so they sometimes argue over who gets to take um, who gets to take that story because they want to see their name in the paper because um, they are very excited when uh, if the newspaper comes to their house, which this newspaper comes to most houses for free, but if if they don't see it and I get to show it to them, uh, their faces light up and they're so happy and so proud of themselves for, for getting into the newspaper. And a little sidebar, I had one girl that took my class um, two times and she was a really good writer and as a freshman she's now the editor of the high school yearbook staff and she's really good and she wrote many many stories for us and she never had one in the in the newspaper and she had she was the editor and and she saw kids that came in and the first story they wrote got in the newspaper and she was getting really frustrated and finally at the end of her eighth grade year one of her stories finally got in the newspaper and I'm not sure I've any, seen anyone so happy about it it was like a, a relief for her own. Uh, monkey off the back kind of a thing. Um, and then since we're on this, past successes. All of these, I'm going to brag a little bit here because it is rewarding. My students with the blog especially have, they have an authentic audience. They write for people that read our blog and I show them the statistics from the blog. Uh, people actually do stop by, they do read, they do click on our stories, they do Google search for things and end up on our blog or do Google search for things specifically that we've written. So, um, so they love it and, and the new students coming in, they see that uh, last year we won an Edge Blog Award for best class blog and we were about three or four votes shy of winning two. And um, last year for the Edge Blogs Challenge, we got to host a challenge. My editors came up with uh, the theme of memories and they came up with several activities related to related to memories and then instead of going to the edge blogs challenge website to get their to get their challenges for the week um, they went to our blog so our traffic shot up that week and we had like a bunch we had a bunch of students stopping by and we had a questionnaire for people to to fill out and we got to interact with students from all over the world that would post on our blog and and tell us information about themselves and and that was really great and so that having that past success and um, just knowing that when they come in to my class as as new students that they have editors in the class that have been a part of of these things and they they want to they want to contribute they want to continue with that they want to contribute to continuing successes and um, and they want to they want to stick around and they want to if they're if they're not eighth graders in their last semester at Cactus Canyon, they, they tend to want to, to be an editor. I get questions all the time in both my Journalism 2 class and my yearbook class. What do I have to do? What do I have to do to be an editor? And so it's, it's a motivating factor for them. They love to, to take on the leadership role and to, and to help other people and to contribute to um, future successes and try and do better than, I mean, they, they, the kids are already asking when when does the edge block award start because they they want to they want to do it again they they want to be a part of getting one of these little badges on our on our blog um, and I think I have one more slide I think there's one more this is just a few um, a few places that have written about us um, the kids love when I we get little comments sometimes on our blog that people have linked our our blog back to um, back to their blog and they've written about our blog specifically of examples of of ways to ways to blog in in junior high elementary high school classrooms and they just list us as an example and so these are just a few things that people have written about us and same kind of deal when the kids see their as when the kids see their story in the newspaper when I show them these posts that someone else somewhere in another country or somewhere across across our country has has said something nice about them. It's it's a pride factor for them, and and they really like to see that. And it's been very rewarding and very successful for us. And um, 
yeah, I love doing what I'm doing, and um, I hope that uh, I didn't talk too long. <laughs> no, Jason, you did not talk too long. Um, but thank you very much for sharing all of that uh, great information. And we are very proud of our Cougar News blog and what uh, Jason Davis is doing with our students in the classroom. And just an excellent example of uh, what uh, giving students an authentic experience can can really be like. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, another really good friend of mine, Regan Roach. She is also an eighth grade science teacher, and she is going to be sharing with you a, a project-based learning opportunity that she gave students. Um, and and I'll turn the mic over to her. Hi. Um, this first slide. So I teach eighth grade science, and the unit that we were studying was. Um, physics, and I took a real-life example that we had had here in our community, and we incorporated it into our unit for physics. Um, a student that these students had gone to school with had um, lost his life crossing a freeway. Um, uh, you know, he was on foot, and so we were looking at that and trying to figure out how to teach them to be more safe, be safer, and. Um, Rather than using that specific example, we changed it and we said, okay, let's do something with bicycle safety. We contacted the city departments here. They worked with us. There were some grants that they had had that, that they were um, using in our schools. And so we worked with some of those employees to come up with a way to take physics and put it into their everyday life. And so we set up a mock accident scene. We had the police department come in. Um, we had the fire department come in and talk about what they do at scenes. And then the kids, so in these pictures here, these were the officers teaching the kids about measuring and why they measure and how they measure um, the skid marks on cars. And to determine the speed that a car was traveling, they talked about how they interview witnesses, um, what, they, what they're looking for, how they can tell if somebody's telling the truth or not. Um, so this is just kind of an introduction of um, where we started. I get a slide there. Oh, my other slide is not there. Um, I guess, oh, it was the Prezi. Sorry, I'm going to have to go kind of blind here. So we set up a mock scene, and the kids went out and measured. They saw um, a bicycle and a vehicle um, that were in an accident. They had to. We talked about Newton's laws of motion, why things move the way they do, uh, actions and reactions. And they had to come back with a police report of what happened in this accident scene, um, who was at fault. They interviewed witnesses. And then the last project that they did was they had to create a video um, that was featured around bike safety. So I know that we had shared the link. There it is, that YouTube link. Um, it's I don't remember how many minutes, but if you watch the video, the first half is what the kids actually did in class. So they used handheld video cameras, and they edited on a you know laptop computer, and um, put together what their ideas were. The winner, so they worked in small groups, and the winner from the school had the opportunity to work with our local fire department. We've worked with them in the past, and they have more of the professional equipment than we do. So we had them come in with their professional equipment, taking the ideas of what the students had, pretty much the same scenario, just making it more realistic. And um, if you watch the video, you'll notice that when the kids did it, the driver got out of the passenger side of the vehicle. I mean, there's just some kind of funny bloopers that as kids, I mean, they're not paying that close of attention. But then when the fire department came back, they were able to help the kids make it more realistic. Um, the kids, I, I wish the Prezi was on here. I should have um, gotten that link over there because oh, the Prezi link is on there. Okay. Um, the kids, can I, whoops, that's the wrong way. Sorry. I wonder if I can click on it. Can I? No. Okay. So if you click on that, what we did thing, that's the kids' presentation. They actually went to the school board here and they presented their entire what we did unit. I didn't change it. There's some typos in it, but it was their work, and um, they had. You'll see that there were a few little typos in there after you know hours of looking at them. I didn't catch it either. So um, they presented it to the school board, and I will say, like 
at one point when the child was laying down because he was hit by the car, the parents were like gasping, like they kind of, that breath was taken out of them. So the realistic factor was definitely there. The kids noticed it, and after the presentation the next day in school, they, they were talking about, man, people really thought that was real. And, and they were very proud of the fact that this was their work and that people were um, like engaged in what they were doing in the classroom. Um, I just felt like doing the project-based learning, talking about physics, I mean, I could have went standard by standard by standard. That to them is boring, but the fact that they were able to do something, so they didn't just learn about physics, but they actually learned why it was important to them, and understanding that, okay, in an, in an accident, it's not just two things hitting each other, but that there are other forces involved in it, and why it would be important. Why, you know, we say, you know, a body is not stronger than a car, and what does that mean? And so for them to be able to understand that, um, they, they got real life work at it. Um, I will say that part of the slide presentation that the kids did, if you look at the Prezi presentation, it will show you their pre-test scores on the standards, and it will show you their post-test scores. Um, and that's important to look at because you have to also remember that when in my classes, I have kids that are both in the advanced classes, but I also have what we call a fundamentals class. Um, so I have kids that are on, you know, the spectrum of autism. I have kids that are, you know, above the 12th grade level when it comes to their learning abilities. So for them to make those type of gains in this project just only reinforces my belief that by connecting it to their real world and making it something that means something to them, um, they're able to learn. The last part is that we also, um, in my time of teaching in Apache Junction, this, this student who passed away was the second one that I've um, known, who, exact same spot on our freeway. Um, the first one was a, a lady who I had, was working with. It was her daughter. And she, at, during this project at one point also, we brought her in and she came in and did an entire presentation about her daughter. And to me, that was probably far more important than them learning the standards because her message to them was that it could happen to them. So it was more than just learning about Newton's laws. It was about teaching them to be safe and making it more of an emotional thing rather than you're just going to school to learn something. Um, so it was really great that she was able, I mean, she got through it, but she talked about who her daughter was and how, you know, the choices that they're making are they can be life-changing. So um, that's kind of the gist of my project. Thank you very much, Regan. Uh, and she is not exaggerating, but when she says that uh, the students were all talking about the different videos and just the impact that it had um, on them um, as students, but then also just as young people in our community and being able to have positive interactions with the police department and the fire department was also uh, another added bon benefit to uh, Reagan's uh, physical science project. Um, in our last few minutes, um, I'm going to go ahead and share with you a little bit about some engineering design challenges that I implement into my classroom instruction um, with the uh, framework for K-12 science document that has been released. Um, there are um, different practices, eight different practices that uh, scientists are wanting students to um, be able to integrate into their learning in the science classroom. And uh, they are asking questions, using models, uh, obtaining and evaluating and communicating evidence, analyzing data using um, math and uh, carrying and planning out investigations, and then also explaining or constructing um, explanations, and then following that up with scientific arguments with, and with evidence. And um, I have found a, a teaching strategy that my students really uh, like to uh, participate in, and that's doing engineering design challenges. And um, when I figured out or when I was thinking about how I could incorporate that, I considered a couple different sources. Um, the first two or sources were these um, books right here, uh, the STEM Lesson Essentials, which 
did a thorough look at the K-12 science and education, and that framework uh, book is uh, what the science teacher leadership program that I'm participating in this school year is actually delving into deeply. Um, and so looking through all, both of those uh, documents, these design challenges um, uh, were a great way to integrate technology into uh, the classroom. Um, and so uh, I'm going to uh, just fly through a couple of slides really quickly just due to time, um, but just so you can have an idea of some of the things that um, I'm doing in the classroom. We do practice the engineering design process and uh, going through all of those different steps. And, uh, and I use actually some low-tech um, tools in the classroom, but just getting students to uh, experience the engineering design process that I'm hoping will give them more confidence in experimenting with other things and going into the engineering field, which does integrate and use technology on every single day. So uh, this particular project, uh, students were given 25 straws and some tape, and they were told to build a structure that would hold a tennis ball uh, 12 inches off the tabletop. And as you can see, there were different solutions to that problem. This particular uh, project, students were given about 50 index cards, and they had, again, build a structure that would support a small stuffed animal, and so uh, had different solutions to those problems. And it's really interesting to hear their discussions with one another. This is really where I hear the, the collaborating and the decision making um, happen on, in a very uh, real way for the students. Um, again, they were given uh, some pipe cleaners, and they had to uh, have a or build a structure that would hold the Dixie cup, and the Dixie cup had pennies inside of it. And so, um, as we all know, that pipe cleaners are fairly flexible. And so, how could they give the pipe cleaner strength to hold um, a, the cup full of pennies? And um, if you were a, a part of that uh, technology conference that we presented um, a month ago, I would have given you an opportunity to uh, practice an engineering design challenge. Um, but maybe this is something that you can do uh, just with uh, the students in your classroom or maybe just some kids that you are in contact with. But just seeing if they can build a, a paper glider that will fly twice as far as from which the height was, it was dropped. And you can use some additional materials to add weight to it or uh, just see what you can come up with. And so that's my little um, design challenge uh, for you all. Um, I see that we have uh, just a couple of minutes left, and uh, you have been asking great questions in the chat box, and hopefully we've been able to answer them um, in a way that's meaningful for you. Um, but if uh, not, uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, ask some questions, then uh, now is your chance. And um, I'd just like to thank you for uh, listening to what we've been doing in the classroom. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to uh, either uh, Peggy or Lori. Thanks, Bethany. I'm just trying to get to our question slide. There we go. I did capture some questions, and I'll go to the beginning of my list. So that goes back to um, just using technology. Someone would like to hear more about what your experiences have been between using netbooks and Chromebooks in classes. Um, I uh, haven't scrolled up, so I'm. I'm wondering if the question is, is there a difference between using Chromebooks and netbooks or just using the device in the classroom? Um, I have both, device, both devices in my classroom. I have a couple mm -hmm. of netbooks, but I also have a cart full of Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, the Chromebooks are real swift because when you just open the lid, they pop on and they're ready to go, whereas the netbooks, they uh, take a little while to uh, for the login process to happen. Um, and I think uh, my experience with Chromebooks might be a little bit different than other teachers on campus, just because we have uh, we've had some issues with um, uh, the wireless system in the building that I'm in, and that's uh, always kind of an interesting thing when we're dealing with technology is what happens when the technology isn't working, mm -hmm. and you have to go back to Plan B. Um, but in so it's just been it's been a learning process, and it's only. 
I would say it took several years to get comfortable with thinking that, okay, this is the way that I'm teaching. And, and sometimes we use the computers every day and there might be a day or two where I don't pull them out of the cart um, because I realize that they're a tool and mm -hmm. there are, as a teacher, there is a lot of different ways that I get to, um, to teach. And thankfully, uh, we have supportive administration that says, you know what, you do what you got to do, and these are the tools that we're going to give you, and find out, figure out a way to use them. But if you don't use them every day, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's that's been it's been a learning process. But and we're just you know now coming into you know oh this is this is just what we do now rather than it being a new thing. Sure. Um, that's great. Let Let's go back to my list. Uh, do you provide professional development for teachers in workshops or mainly through your collaboration coaching? How do you decide what they need for professional development? Do you use surveys? Um, we, at the, five years ago when Cactus Canyon opened and we started the one-to-one -one program, we went through hours and hours and hours of training that our district provided and um, just to get teachers um, comfortable with using the devices in their classroom. And even now, uh, we have, our students have cycled up to the high school with the one-to-one um, -one computers, and it's the juniors in the high school uh, in our district that are using the computers, and it's the first time that their teachers have gone without textbooks and are using the one-to-one -one mm -hmm. device. And so those uh, junior level high school teachers are going through, a, they went through a lot of professional development this summer, and they're continuing mm -hmm. to get professional development uh, this school year. And, um, and now, because so many teachers in their district have been through that program, now we rely upon our collaboration coaches um, at each school to uh, provide any kind of training and yes, surveys um, on occasion are taken just to see and feel out what people feel like their needs are. That's great. Um, I'm going to go back to the list here. What are some of their journalism topics? That's for me. Um, That's right. That's we right. mostly write about things. We mostly write about things that happen at school. Um, we write about clubs and activities. What we try to do is focus on what's going on in classrooms and the different things. Kind of um, like what we're doing here is highlighting the interesting projects and interesting activities that are going on at our school. Um, we, we're trying to expand a little bit and um, think about some more uh, larger topics, not just things that happen at Cactus Canyon, but things that happen everywhere and how they relate to Cactus Canyon. We've been able to do, we have done a series on bullying in the past and we've done some other things and we, we have a list of, of story ideas that that we're trying to hash out more featurey stories that would take longer to write and require more research. But um, mostly what we do for right now is, is we write about what's happening at school and, and how we can promote that and get the word out about how great we are at Cactus Canyon. That's great. Uh, let's see. Um. Was there a measurable learning assessment done with the kids later? And this goes to, to the physics project. That's when the question came up. Um, I can go ahead and address that um, on behalf of Reagan. Uh, she had to step out. Her son is okay. in the um, state uh, final or competition for marching band. So <laughs> she needed to go oh, wow. in his performance. Uh, so but uh, yes, we because we still have to meet our district um, uh, benchmark uh, goals, uh, students were given uh, a paper and pencil assessment um, for those standards in addition to the project. Great. Um, and this, this is for you, Bethany. Do you have a, a graphic of that engineering design process available on the I website? 
It is uh, on the um, slideshow. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. um, are the engineering challenges in the live binder? Um, I did not put them in there. Um, I have just done my um, own research on them, um, finding some in Pinterest and and other uh, and other um, organizations. Some sometimes have posted design challenges, um, mm -hmm. but I have not posted what I've actually done online. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, I'm I'm pausing only because I have to sort through the ones that <laughs> have been answered and the ones that haven't been answered. Right. Um, does the space or classroom facility need to change to accommodate these ideas or activities? Um, sometimes they do. Uh, sometimes the, our classroom space needs to change. Sometimes we can uh, just make do with what we um, have. And m most teachers in our school have desks or tables that are arranged in groups or pods mm -hmm. um, and because that allows for a better collaboration among the students. Sure. Okay. Um, does the lack of textbooks impact students at home? That is, can parents still assist? I think that uh, the students in our district, as well as their parents, have adjusted to not necessarily having textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, and because so much of what we do is posted online, okay. um, we all have our teacher websites that uh, students and parents can refer to to know what it is that we're doing. That's great. Um, does Cactus Canyon do any flipped classrooms? Uh, we have done some in the past, and mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not aware of anyone who's using that teaching uh, type of teaching right now. Um, one of the big hurdles that we found is that not all of our families have online access at home. Mm -hmm. And so when we would give students assignments or you know uh, to do at home, it wasn't getting done um, because of just lack of internet provision for the students. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a barrage of online publishing tools. How do you decide which would be most effective for your class goals? I think Jason can best. Uh, yeah, that, I think that goes to Jason. His. Thank you. When when we started the blog, I just looked around and WordPress. We use WordPress for the blog, and that was that seemed like the best one for what we needed to do, and it was free, so that was helpful. And other things I have just I've just you I learned about uh, why am I blanking uh, I learned about VoiceThread a few years ago and I thought it was really a great way to <laughs> to use to to do digital storytelling and that's what I've been using ever since I know there's there's new things um, when before I got my set of Chromebooks I had netbooks and I had a different a different newspaper design program on there. And when I got Chromebooks, you can't install anything on Chromebooks, so I had to find something that was web-based. And thankfully, our uh, district tech person came through and found Lucid Press for me, and I've been using that. And so, really, it's just things that I've learned about through our professional development that that Bethany talked about, and kind of things that I've that I've stuck with. At least as far as those uh, publication tools, I know there's more things out there. These things are still working for me, and I don't, I haven't felt the need to to change mm -hmm. yet. Terrific. Do the students also get to choose tools and sites on their own? Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. they can. I think especially for the for the education or for the edge blocks challenge. Mm -hmm. There are challenges and activities where they um, need to make a presentation or they need to um, do digital storytelling or something like that. And then if they choose to do that activity, then they can choose how to how to do their do their do their activity for the for the week. I have um, some kids right now that are using 
Prezi <clears throat> and um, actually a couple that I had never even heard of that I don't know the names of. So yeah, there are there are some, uh, not all the time, um, for you know the specific projects that I ask them to do, I direct them to what to what tech tools to use. But sometimes there are indeed times where they get to pick what they like best, and sometimes they want to try something new, or sometimes they um, want to just go with what they're familiar with. But those op op opportunities are available. Great. How do you do you evaluate the, the activities? Do you have special grids or rubrics? Which skills do you evaluate? Um, are you referring to the um, design challenges? I think so. Um, I uh, and the onset when I'm introducing a, a challenge, I tell students um, uh, what um, what they need to do in order to uh, get the highest amount of points um, mm -hmm. possible. And so yes, so I do evaluate them, and it's um, if their challenge. Um, for example, yesterday we did a design challenge where students had to build a bridge out of uh, different materials, and um, I told them that for every ten pennies that their bridge supported, they would get a point up to ten points. And so mm -hmm. we just did that. And so, um, so yes, I do explain to students the the um, grading system as I introduce a challenge. Great. Is there any peer evaluation for those challenges? I think. You know, I I really hadn't thought about that, but that would be a great uh, thing for other students to do. So, uh, I'll lighten my load maybe a little mm -hmm. bit, maybe. And also with the design challenge, the students create their own design specification. It sounds like you give them goals to reach. Uh, yes, uh, for the most part, I do uh, give them the constraints and the materials mm -hmm. and the uh, challenge that they're going to be participating in. But towards the end of the school year, after they have more experience, then um, I have let students design their own. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Uh, do you include graphic arts? And if you do, which programs or websites do you recommend? And this goes to the whole group. Um, I don't have anything in particular that that I refer to, but um, it's just again, it goes back to instead of referring to a teacher's manual, mm -hmm. um, it's just doing online research and seeing. Uh, what um, activities or websites or um, different ideas for students to use in the classroom, which ones are reliable and dependable for content and um, and for ease of use. And so it so it's just a different way of spending my time when I'm lesson planning. Sure, and I think that leads to this question as well. So are all teachers using their website to post resources for the courses since they don't have textbooks? Are they using other tools to create their own textbooks? Um, our district ha has a, a teacher web page for every teacher. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we post all of our work and links and um, okay. other things for students to refer to. And can people outside of the district access those resources? Uh, yes, they can, as they long can. as they know the teacher website, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you go to our um, school website, which Jason can post on um, in the chat box, and then there's teacher sites mm -hmm. is one of the links that uh, they can find, and then you can see all of our teacher websites. Terrific. Those were the questions I was able to capture during your presentation, as well as the ones that just came in in, in the chat at the last couple minutes. Um, so thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and wrap up the show now. These are our upcoming shows. And it looks like Peggy is going to jump in and talk about these. Yes, I just want to quickly do an overview of the upcoming shows, but also to say a huge thank you to Bethany, Jason, Cheryl, and Reagan for this outstanding presentation. And I wish we had even more time for Q&A. This is so valuable to hear how you have worked these things out in your classrooms. So thanks to all of you. Um, we have some great shows coming up. Next week, we're going to be hearing from a, 
a fantastic teacher librarian in Montana, and she's going to be our November featured teacher. On November 15th, we're going to get the opportunity to learn all about edweb.net and where you can find tons of free professional development from Lisa Schmucky. And I believe she's going to have some teachers and principals with her to share their uses of edweb.net too. November 22nd, we're going to drill down on Google Drive and Google Classroom with Lisa Thuman, she is such a pro, and we're going to learn lots of things about those things. No show Thanksgiving weekend. Um, we think we're going to be having an Hour of Code show on December 6th. And then December 13th, Stephen Anderson is going to do an amazing uh, demonstration of class flow. If you haven't discovered that tool, and it's free, you're going to be so impressed. Then we'll take a winter break, and we'll come back to celebrate 2013, I should say 14, on January 10th. That's always a really fun show to kind of look back. Uh, over the years. So hope that you can join us for all of those. And I'll turn it back to Lori. Thank you, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest venture. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including the host your own webinar. You can sign up for a use of a Blackboard Collaborate classroom for free on this site as long as you make the program you're presenting public. You can nominate a featured teacher at this form, uh, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the e at the end. And you can nominate yourself for a featured teacher spot as well. There's a featured teacher each month. When you exit the session, your browser should open the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. The link is also in the chat. Or you can get to the survey through the Resources tab in the Live Binder. Once you complete the survey at the bottom, you, re you can request a professional development certificate. Please make sure this email is a personal email rather than a school email. School, make, school email accounts tend to block this from arriving to you. All of the shows can be accessed through iTunes U in either a video collection or audio collection. There is also a way to get to previous shows with the RSS feed. On the, the link is on the uh, website, so you can get to past shows that way in addition to the other methods. And again, special thanks today to the Cactus Canyon Junior High teachers, Bethany Ligon, Cheryl Anderson, Jason Davis, and Reagan Roach, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution to Weebly.com for providing the, our website and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thanks so much for coming. And remember, in order for that recording to process, you do need to leave the room. <laughs>